All right, let's talk now about part two of the doll's house, issue number 11 of the Sandman. This uh, starts with a jump forward in time as well as a jump forward in location. We've got Rose, who's now in Florida looking for her brother. Yeah, who is merely mentioned in the previous issue. And so this starts with her moving into this house. Uh, so you've got the doll's house. We've already seen Unity's doll's house. And then this, this uh, southern uh, house that we see right at the very beginning is... Uh, very much like that doll's house or it's at least reminiscent of it and you've got a figure in a window you know looking out the way that we had over there so you've got that sort of motif going on so what did you think about uh, about this chapter of her moving in and meeting all these people who live in this house very strange people I would think I thought it was very cool how right at the beginning of the story you see the sequence with Dream talking to the raven Matthew uh, saying that Rose as the vortex is likely to attract all of the stray dreams and then you see her in this house with a bunch of, you know, admittedly slightly odd people. So my initial reaction was to think, oh, I guess maybe some of them are just missing dreams, um, which is a good instinct, but not quite... Uh... It's very smart, very smart. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't actually put that together. Now I wonder why. But the first time I read it, I didn't think that. I just, I did, I did wonder if she was having a dream. Uh, like as if oh. if she was there just because Barbie and Ken at yeah, the beginning yeah. especially were so weird and then those um, um, the the two women the ones who collect stuffed spiders yes yeah. yeah because because that part of it I mean it was very dreamlike or very nightmarish and I but but yes I mean I once I realized she was in Florida I thought they were just weird people I never thought of <laughs> any of them being any of the stray dreams that's very clever and then you've got uh, Jed I like the way that his dreams are represented to you in a sort of homage to the Little Nemo in Slumberland comics oh you're aware of Little Nemo <laughs> in Slumberland are you? I would not have been aware to be fair if I had not uh, watched your channel I think it's fantastic that Neil Gaiman and uh, the artists have this tribute to Little Nemo in here but what I find really interesting interesting is Windsor McKay's Little Nemo is really known for its incredible dreamscapes where you've got all kinds of shapes and sizes of, uh, uh, of, of objects and uh, environments but the dreams that you see over here are more about that dislocation, disconnection. The text of Little Nemo is never the most impressive part of it. <laughs> it's always the visuals but over here it's the text. It's that kind of innocent talk and the rather expository oh I'm falling oh what has what has happened over yeah. here not the parts of the Little Nemo comic strip that are the most famous but the ones adapted over here to make it truly nightmarish to make it not feel lovely and charming and wonderful and I think one of the coolest things about this particular issue is how the the melding of all these different plot lines happens so seamlessly so you can go from one to the other and they're all they're all sort of building on each other and I thought it, it's just a really great way to tell the story. Yes, in the land of marvelous dreams is both a connection to the dreaming, but we also know that he's been, as we find out later, that he's been cut off from the dreaming. He's been sort of moved into a little pocket universe of dreams that is just his. And so it's both an amputation as well as an escape at the same time. But it does connect to the larger thematic parts of the story, which is all about dreams and dream realms and moving between the realms that we've seen both Morpheus and uh, Rose do uh, right now, and maybe even the the kindly ones and now we get another character who seems to be moving back and forth but is really um you know maybe taking shelter in one over the other but it's it's a little more complicated than that of course as we're going oh, yeah. to find out oh the, i did have a question in this in this bit yes so um the conversation that i mentioned earlier that the dream has with the raven that he's set to spy on uh, on rose and get him a picture of her brother he is he says he's creating a nightmare during that conversation i wasn't sure if that nightmare comes up later in this issue or if that's just background. It's a good question. I think the first time I read it, I took that to be texture where this is what Morpheus does. Mm. He's a lord of dreams. So he creates nightmares, mm. he creates realms, he creates people. Uh, it's also a sort of a replacement for the Corinthian. I oh, right. The way I looked at it is that he had a nightmare uh, that he built, uh, that he created, who has escaped. And so therefore he needs a uh, 
a new one. So he's he's in the process of doing that. I think it might be part of that rebuilding of the realm and rebuilding oh, yes. of the dreaming yeah. that has fallen into disrepair uh, that we found out about in the previous volume as well. So you've got this nightmarish scenario of this child who's trapped in a basement and this kind of dream world that they're living in. But at the same time, you also have Rose, who is now... Who is now in that uh, house? With, with a whole bunch of strange housemates, including, I was gonna talk about Gilbert a little bit because he, he comes across as sort of the most normal of the inhabitants of that house where he's, I mean, sure, he's a little old fashioned, but. The pompously British person <laughs> is the most normal person. You meet Gilbert a little later. He's not there at the beginning. The first time he's mentioned, he's asking for what is it, a six foot long pencil so he can draw on the ceiling or something like that, isn't, isn't oh, that? Oh yeah. So, so not that normal then. <laughs> well, I mean, not, not, not at least as far as the first mention is concerned. But it is obviously a heroic figure because he saves Rose yeah. from, uh, from uh, the attackers. Although why people choose to... I guess she does say that it was a mistake to go into that alley thinking it was a shortcut. So Gilbert is introduced as a heroic knight glee kind of figure but he's got this cane uh yeah with which he he saves her from those attackers and he just comes across as this really sort of nice gentlemanly uh he's very polite yeah he refers to miss walker yeah and then you've got a different kind of transition between this world and the other where you've got a raven who picks up a photograph and then just flies and then he's with Morpheus. It's in his flight somewhere that he is crossed over. Yeah. It's almost... Um, the yet another character who can cross over between dreaming and reality. But in, in, in a way that uh, reminded me of Peter Pan, you know, sort of where you go to Neverland just by oh. flying and you just keep flying and then you're in this other realm and maybe, you know, but that doesn't mean that if you're in an airplane, you'll get there. And then we get back to the Corinthian. Yeah, at the end of this issue, I felt like it just cut very, very quickly between the three different storyline so you've got um, Jed in his sort of dungeon uh, his dream dungeon you could say and you've got uh, Gilbert and Rose going off to find him you've got Morpheus having figured out where Jed is and you've got the Corinthian um, creepily chomping on eyeballs yeah that's pretty fantastic I mean this is a perfect example I think of where more is achieved through just innuendo than it would be through graphical representation. You've got these eyeballs next to the phone and then a bloody hand and the eyeballs going away and the chomping, chomping kind of sound effects in which all of it is just, it's its happening in your mind. Yeah. Uh, what's going on over here where he's snacking on these eyeballs while he finishes his telephone conversation. And then of course, the, the the horrific scene of the, the bodies that he's leaving behind. But yes, this issue ends in a terrific way with all of them sort of converging yeah. in headed in one direction. Very cinematic. It's very... That's uh, what I was thinking, yeah. It's very much like a, a modern day television show would have the end of an episode as a, as a cliffhanger. And then of course, this sort of terrific made for a poster ending of Dream with his helm and his... Uh, Cloak. Ready uh, to go out and of course, uh, to be continued. All right, so that's part two. Let's move on to part three of The Doll's House, issue number 12 of The Sandman. Playing house. Playing house. So you had moving in, which started with the Florida thing and the house, and you've got another house reference in the title. Playing house being about the husband and the wife and the family and the story set up of Hector and... Lighter. And Lighter. This is sort of telling us what has happened to Jed, where you find out where the two... Uh, the uh, Two of the dream entities have gone, Brute and Glob. Which seems like a sort of a superhero uh, story, you know, and uh, even, even uh, Hector's uh, appearance is kind of like... It's a golden age superhero sort of take, you know, with a cape and a, and a mask and a hood and all of that stuff. And he considers himself the Sandman because that's what he's been told. But he obviously comes up against the real Sandman, who's not at all a superhero looking creature <laughs> uh, and uh, who's very amused. Uh, at least for a, a little while. What did you think about this storyline? The 
the abuse stuff is pretty horrific oh, uh, yeah. with the kid These foster relatives, parents yeah, yeah they yeah. obviously they're they're a good contrast to the housemates that rose has in the previous issue where they're not related to her at all but they're really warm and kind as opposed to these two and i i actually really liked the way that this issue gives you the two the two realities that jed's in the reality that he's dreamed up and that Brute and Glob have kind of colonized and the horrific sort of reality of the basement and the smells and the, the darkness and the awfulness. And it's almost like one is feeding the other, right? So Brute and Glob seem to be drawing power from, uh, from his dreams. This is where I thought um, that aspect of dream that comes up in the prologue is really well realized, which is that he's quite ruthless when he's got an objective in mind and he doesn't really care too much about the fallout. So the end of this, where he has that conversation with um, Lyta after he's dispatched Hector and he's sort of taken Brute and Glob out of their little realm, he he just doesn't seem to really care about the emotional impact of what he's done on this woman. Yeah, you know, I never get the sense of he's doing things out of a sense of right and wrong. Mm. You know, it's not a question of morality, although um, that does that does change later in some other stories. But in this particular story, or with before, with the prologue story... Tails in the sand. Yeah, he just wants the woman he wants. Yeah. Over here, it's just, how dare you? He's not really talking about what's good and bad, or what's right and wrong. It's more about a transgression against him. And so even when he encounters Hector, he's always like little ghost. He's so condescending. He is, he's, yeah. He, he, you know, as I said, he's... And he bursts out laughing at him. Yes, so. he's amused. Yeah. And, and so so that amusement buys Hector a little bit of time in which he's just like, okay, I'll let you entertain me for a few more minutes and now almost put you out of your misery. Yeah. That's the approach yeah. that he takes. But I think more than that sort of cosmic interdimensional battle, uh, it's not even a battle, uh, you know, where he just completely wipes the floor with Hector, not even with Brute and Glob, you know, where, again, he's just so powerful and he's completely in control and uh, they're now cowering in front of him and they're just like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, they're, they're completely, they've just given up. When they know he's coming, they're just like, oh, well, you knew it, it would end someday. <laughs> but it's his interaction with Lyta that's the most interesting and yeah. the most compelling bit of this to me as well. Of course, it ends on a slightly mysterious note because we know that there is a child. The child that Lyta is carrying is... Dream's child, as he says. So, uh, of course, is it any? Is there any point to me asking you whether that comes up later, or would the answer be a spoiler? I wouldn't know. I really, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> but it is interesting because she's been pregnant two For, years yeah, or longer, something like yeah. that. So yes, this isn't this isn't a uh, normal baby, and her husband's dead again. Even over here, he's like, be thankful that you had two more years, you know, with your husband and uh, all of that stuff. I mean, we understand that uh, she's been sort of torn as well. She's not realized that she's in a dream, but she's kind of realized that she knows things are yeah. wrong. She's been questioning it. She's like, shouldn't I have had the baby by now? And when did we come here? Those are the kind of questions. And I think it's fantastic. It's those little things that really make me appreciate how much uh, dreams have, uh, how well dreams have been captured in this comic. Yeah. Because that's exactly the kind of thing that happens in dreams. Yeah. And you're not really sure when you got here. You're not really sure how much time has passed. You don't remember those things. You just exist sort of in the moment and the before and after of it is very very uh, murky and that's kind of the way it's been for Lyta right at the end Dream seems to sort of break all of this down and just expects her to be fine with it yeah. and alright he doesn't have any sympathy or empathy for her trauma yeah. and what she's going through she she sort of jumps at him she tries to uh, yeah, she's attack a, him she's a really interesting character which is why I kind of hope that she comes up later on as well yeah and I mean the last thing we see of her you know when he says that I'll come back and one day I'll you know your, your child will be mine and her thing is you take my child over my dead body. It's very defiant. Even the frame of her like over there with her like legs spread eagle, it's almost as if she's about to give birth yeah. right now because she's so pregnant. But it's it's pure defiance in this little pool of light. Everything is darkness. So she, she comes across as, uh, you know, like the one person who so far has really been able to um, sort of stand up to dream, but even the, though other people have tried. The, she's the second woman. 
there's nada and there's her so i think it's interesting that it's usually like at least so far it's been female characters who are willing to defy him or go against what he what he says well yes i mean nada ended up tormented in hell for all of eternity yeah. for her this thing but yes you're right because um again we saw that in issue number 8 where death can like sort of whap him on top of the head and say all right you know like snap out of it yeah. and enough is enough of your mooning around and she can really you know the older sister uh, so yes the female characters so far have really been able to um it is interesting that we're not quite sure whether desire is a male or female because she keeps switching between the two so she's brother and sister to dream so i guess we'll have to see how um how that holds up but at the end of this issue we've got jed who's sort of been freed yeah. and uh, and 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 dream um, even takes care of uh, his horrible uncle and aunt but immediately gets picked up by the corinthian right so yeah. he just can't catch a break no i was thinking that it's just like from the frying pan into the fire is epitomized by this ending i know but it's a little i mean to me it's like there's the end of the jed storyline right i mean or at least as far as the horrors that he was undergoing but because you don't have gilbert and uh, rose, rose. Uh, uh, there yet because they were told by the police no they haven't yet that that is when at, at the beginning of the next right issue. right so because gilbert and rose are not there yet i mean you've got to have something else uh, going on and so therefore jed now gets picked up by the corinthian so to me it was this is one of those things right in the early stories uh, where just like there were four people or four major dream entities that got away and jed was imprisoned by two of them i mean it's just an incredible coincidence that as soon <laughs> as he gets uh, you know as soon as he's able to escape from two of them he encounters a third one um you know without morpheus encountering uh, because yeah so anyway we we obviously find out what happens to all of them uh continuing in the story with uh dolls house part 4 